Welcome to the 2019 English Paper 1 of Aga Khan University Examination Board HSSC Part 1 Examination. We will begin the paper with a 25-minute listening comprehension section. You will hear recording of two passages. Each passage will be played two times. On each passage, you will answer questions written on your Paper 1 booklet. Listen carefully to the first passage, then open Paper 1 booklet and read questions 1 to 10. You will get two minutes for reading. The passage will be played one more time. You can make notes on your question paper. When the recording has finished, enter your answers on the separate answer sheet provided to you. You will have four minutes to pencil in your answers. Follow the instructions on the front page of paper 1 to show which of the options A, B, C or D you have selected for each question. Do not turn over the page until you are told. Now please listen to the passage. Ochre Artists have been painting with ochre, which is a naturally occurring pigment, for hundreds of thousands of years. Their masterpieces range from prehistoric ochre pigmented images on cave walls to paintings on canvases and other artwork from medieval times and onward. Ochre is clay pigment that contains oxidized iron, said Paul Petit, a professor of archaeology at Durham University in the United Kingdom. Ochre occurs naturally in rocks and soil. It's actually very easy to obtain, Petit said. Anybody who is using caves or operating in and around valleys will quite easily discover ochre. People during caves who pick up ochre will notice that it stains their hands a nice red or yellow color. Once collected, it can easily be grated against a coarse piece of stone or ground by a mortar and pestle, and then turned into a powder. Then, this powder can be mixed with a liquid such as water, saliva or egg whites and turned into pigmented paint. Ochre can also be used as a crayon in drawing. It is very pliable, Petit said. You can break it into small lumps. Therefore, the oldest drawing is an image of a cow-like beast created with ochre on a cave wall in Borneo, Indonesia, dating to about 40,000 years ago. After the time of these early sites, ochre paintings became more widespread, reaching Africa, Europe, the Middle East, Southeast Asia, Russia and Australia. It is relatively common to find ochre covered burials. It is likely that ochre colored the deceased's clothing, but as the clothing decayed, the ochre stained the grave and bones red. Moreover, red is a striking color that's easy to see, especially in the low light setting of a cave. Other than serving as paint, ochre had plenty of uses. People used it to tan hides as mosquito repellent, for protection against the sun or cold, for medicinal purposes, for use in the extraction or processing of plants, and as an adhesive such as attaching handles to stone tools. Read questions 1 to 10. You have 2 minutes time for reading. Listen to the recording again. While listening, you may keep the question booklet open in front of you. Ochre 
Artists have been painting with ochre, which is a naturally occurring pigment, for hundreds of thousands of years. Their masterpieces range from prehistoric ochre pigmented images on cave walls to paintings on canvases and other artworks from medieval times and onward. Ochre is clay pigment that contains oxidized iron, said Paul Petit, a professor of archaeology at Durham University in the United Kingdom. Ochre occurs naturally in rocks and soil. It's actually very easy to obtain, Petit said. Anybody who is using caves or operating in and around valleys will quite easily discover ochre. People during caves who pick up ochre will notice that it stains their hands a nice red or yellow color. Once collected, it can easily be grated against a coarse piece of stone or ground by a mortar and pestle, and then turned into a powder. Then, this powder can be mixed with a liquid such as water, saliva or egg whites and turned into pigmented paint. Ochre can also be used as a crayon in drawing. It is very pliable, Petit said. You can break it into small lumps. Therefore, the oldest drawing is an image of a cow-like beast created with ochre on a cave wall in Borneo, Indonesia, dating to about 40,000 years ago. After the time of these early sites, ochre paintings became more widespread, reaching Africa, Europe, the Middle East, Southeast Asia, Russia and Australia. It is relatively common to find ochre covered burials. It is likely that ochre colored the deceased's clothing, but as the clothing decayed, the ochre stained the grave and bones red. Moreover, red is a striking color that's easy to see, especially in the low light setting of a cave. Other than serving as paint, ochre had plenty of uses. People used it to tan hides as mosquito repellent, for protection against the sun or cold, for medicinal purposes, for use in the extraction or processing of plants, and as an adhesive such as attaching handles to stone tools. Now record the answers to the questions in the multiple choice answer sheet. You will have four minutes to record your answers.
Now we will play another passage. This will also be played two times. Social movements and marketing. Marketeers tend to like courageous actions that grab attention. Yet, all too often, we ignore demanding work that comes before. To market a product or an idea, marketeers have to change minds and that takes time and a lot of careful work. That's a lesson we have witnessed in the social movements of the last century. Although the outside observer may only notice the movement when the dominoes start falling, the people inside the movement worked tirelessly for ages to change minds. The arc of history is long the length of a career rather than a marketing campaign. And yet, despite differences, there are several lessons that marketeers can learn from successful social movements. First, successful movements start by attacking perceptions. Consider the march to Washington that took place in United States of America in 1963. That was when Martin Luther King Jr. gave his historic I Have a Dream speech. It was designed to appeal to mainstream America. King invoked the Declaration of Independence of America, speaking not just to the problems of African Americans, but also to the founding principles of the Republic. Even people who hadn't experienced cruelty had adopted King's ideas. Cognitive psychologists believe that we see things in the context of connections that already exist in our minds. Second, Successful movements build connections through personal contact rather than trying to burst on the scene all at once. It is easy for marketeers looking to copy their success to take note of the end game while ignoring the opening moves. To return to our historical example, although the March to Washington is a famous historical event, its success was the culmination of hundreds of smaller events staged by groups in cities and towns for a long period of time. That brings us to the third essential attribute of successful movements. They connect to the mainstream. This makes all the difference. While it may be more comfortable to cater to passionate enthusiasts, unless we can appeal to the mainstream, we won't get very far. Now read questions 11 to 20. You will have two minutes time for reading. Do not turn over the page until you are told. Listen to the passage again. By listening, you may keep the question booklet open in front of you. Social movements and marketing. Marketeers tend to like courageous actions that grab attention. Yet, all too often, we ignore demanding work that comes before. To market a product or an idea, marketeers have to change minds and that takes time and a lot of careful work. That's a lesson we have witnessed in the social movements of the last century. Although the outside observer may only notice the movement when the dominoes start falling, the people inside the movement worked tirelessly for ages to change minds. The arc of history is long. 
the length of a career rather than a marketing campaign. And yet, despite differences, there are several lessons that marketeers can learn from successful social movements. First, successful movements start by attacking perceptions. Consider the march to Washington that took place in United States of America in 1963. That was when Martin Luther King Jr. gave his historic I Have a Dream speech. It was designed to appeal to mainstream America. King invoked the Declaration of Independence of America, speaking not just to the problems of African Americans, but also to the founding principles of the Republic. Even people who hadn't experienced cruelty had adopted King's ideas. Cognitive psychologists believe that we see things in the context of connections that already exist in our minds. Second, successful movements build connections through personal contact rather than trying to burst on the scene all at once. It is easy for marketeers looking to copy their success to take note of the end game while ignoring the opening moves. To return to our historical example, although the March to Washington is a famous historical event, its success was the culmination of hundreds of smaller events staged by groups in cities and towns for a long period of time. That brings us to the third essential attribute of successful movements. They connect to the mainstream. This makes all the difference. While it may be more comfortable to cater to passionate enthusiasts, unless we can appeal to the mainstream, we won't get very far. Now record the answers to the questions in the multiple choice answer sheet. You will have four minutes to record your answers.
You should now go on to the next section of paper 1 which is reading comprehension. You will have 30 minutes for that section. Thank you and good luck. Welcome to the 2018 English Paper 1 of Aachen University Examination Board, HSSC Part 1 Examination. We will begin the paper with a 25-minute listening comprehension section. You will hear recording of two passages. Each passage will be played two times. On each passage, you will answer questions written on your Paper 1 booklet. Listen carefully to the first passage, then open Paper 1 booklet and read questions 1 to 10. You will get two minutes for reading. The passage will be played one more time. You can make notes on your question paper. When the recording has finished, enter your answers on the separate answer sheet provided to you. You will have four minutes to pencil in your answers. Follow the instruction on the front page of paper 1 to show which of the options A, B, C or D you have selected for each question. Do not turn over the page until you are told. Now, please listen to the passage. How Sugar Affects the Brain Picture warm gooey cookies, crunchy candies, velvety cakes, waffle cones piled high with ice cream. Is your mouth watering? Are you craving dessert? Why? What happens in the brain that makes sugary foods so hard to resist? Sugar is a general term used to describe a class of molecules called carbohydrates and it's found in a wide variety of food and drinks. Just check the labels on sweet products you buy glucose, fructose, 